Vajrayavadi Uschachade Satarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhai Evata Patita Nam Pavane Bio Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare All right so we're studying Srimad Bhagavatam for Bhakti Vaibhav, we're on third canto, chapter number 21 today. Chapter 21 entitled Conversation Between Manu and Kardama. <clears throat> so we heard yesterday about uh, Vidura approaching Maitreya and asking questions about the creation, about how the Manus created everything. So it's continuing today in the 20, 21st chapter in this way. So text number one. <clears throat> the line of Vidura speaking, the, the line of Swambhuva Manu was most esteemed, O worshipful sage, I beg you, give me an account of this race whose progeny multiplied through sexual intercourse. So, uh, Prabhupada talks about producing good population. It's very important for any uh, civilized society. You want to have nice people, good people with good qualities. So, Swayambhuva Manu, and his sons, they were given this job to populate the universe, to produce nice population, ex exemplary population. All right, and then Text number two explains more about Swayambhuva Manu and his own family. Swayambhuva Manu had the two sons who were both famous, both described in Srimad Bhagavatam. Priyavrata was described in the fifth canto and Uttanapada who is coming in the, in the fourth canto. So he had two sons and then there were also three daughters most prominent amongst them, the three daughters, was Devahuti. You're going on to hear about Devahuti, the, the last five chapters of, or more, maybe eight chapters of, last chapters of Srimad Bhagavatam are all about the activities of Devahuti and her son Kapila, and Kapila's teachings to his mother, Devahuti. So Devahuti is one of the daughters of Swayambhuva Manu, and we'll be hearing about her today, how she's arranged to marry Kardama Muni. Anyway, here first we're told Priyavrata and Uttanapada ruled the world consisting of seven islands, just according to religious principles. And so in the purport, Prabhupada mentions what are the seven islands. And there were many great kings coming in that line. We have Maharaj Yudhisthira, we have also Lord Ramachandra. So, so many great souls all came in that line from uh, Svainbhuva Manu. Of course, historians today, they don't have information about these kings. Their records of history don't go back very far. If you study history, you know, they, they, they give you the idea that there was no civilization on the planet or it was just animals because they promote Darwin theory. So the, their history, their records of history are very short. They're only, only relating like the last 500 years or a 
thousand years. And after that, practically, there's no records. So it's, it's very difficult, of course, for us to get these Western historians to accept the fact that there was civilization on the planet and there was advanced civilization on the planet a long time ago. That's very much against the the mindset of the Western people. So then uh, Vidura is speaking to Maitreya, he says, O sinless one, you have spoken of his daughter known by the name Devahuti as the wife of the sage Kadama the Lord of created beings. So Kardama is also one of the Prajapatis. Actually, at the beginning of the universe, all of the sons of Brahma were like Prajapatis. Although Kardama Muni is a great yogi, still he has that job, he has that, he's given that service, that he has to help his father to populate the universe. So Vidura is questioning more. Text number four, how many offspring did the great yogi beget through the princess who was endowed with eightfold perfection in the yoga principles? So that's interesting to know that Devahoti is also a great yogi. So just as uh, Kadama Muni is a great yogi with mystic powers, his wife was, was also a great yogini, and she's described there, well, first of all, Kardama is described as Mahayogi, a great mystic, and Devahuti is described as a yoga lakshana, or one advanced in yoga. So you can understand, they're a nice match for each other. <laughs> they both have their yoga powers are both very advanced in yoga. It's surprising to read that a princess, someone who's a princess, that she's also a great yogi. Of course, that is why she was able to accept Kardama as a husband. Other women, they wouldn't be, you know, especially a princess, she wouldn't be very happy to marry a man who's living in a hermitage in the forest. She would say, I'm not going to live there. How can we have, bring up our family here in the forest? We have to have a proper home. We have to have facilities. You have to go and get a job. You have to work. <laughs> anyway, Kadama is a great yogi, Maha yogi. And he could arrange everything just by his yoga powers. Prabhupada also gives an interest, interesting translation to the eight stages of Astanga Yoga. When I was reading over this chapter, I was impressed how Prabhupada uh, changed the terms of these different stages of the Astanga Yoga. So, Yama Niyam, okay, Yam, control of the senses, Niyam following the rules and regulations. Number three, asanas, the sitting postures. Four, controlling the breath or pranayama. Sometimes Prabhupada will call it nose pressing. Then number five, withdrawing the senses from the sense objects, pratyahara. And that's all right. And then concentration of the mind, that's dharana. And meditation, dhyana, but then samadhi, Prabhupada puts as self-realization. And after, then he says, after self-realization, there are eight further perfectional stages called the yoga siddhis. So uh, it's an interesting addition to the Astanga yoga that after coming to the samadhi stage, then you can go on to acquire the yoga siddhis. 
So this is the Ashtanga Yoga process which was popular in the Satya Yuga. Because Satya Yuga, people lived a long life. The average life was 100,000 years. People could live for one lakh years. And so they could practice meditation, just like Kadama Muni. Kadama Muni's been doing his uh, meditation for 10,000 years. So 10,000 years out of 100,000 years is not a long time. It's not a big percentage. We may think, oh, 10,000 years. Of course, we're Kali Yuga people. You know, if we, if we live 70 years, that's our life. You know, our time is up after 70. That's what the, the Christian Bible says anyway. The 70, uh, three score year and 10, they describe it, meaning 70. So 70 is a good life, you had a good life. But it's only in Kali Yuga. In Satya Yuga, people could live a long life and they could do this uh, Astanga Yoga. But in Kali Yuga, who can do it? They do have some places, they're teaching Kundalini Yoga and Astanga Yoga. It's a joke. It's a joke. And they're teaching people to do meditation. It's another joke. They meditate. They sit in the yoga studio or they sit in their own home and meditate. That's not the process. You want to do meditation, you have to get out of the home. Described in the Bhagavad Gita, you have to go to the mountains or go to the jungle. You have to go alone, then you have to sit there and, and then you practice meditation. You don't just sit at home for two hours. So to do, a, a, to do Astanga Yoga in the Kali Yuga, very, very difficult. You know, to get people to practice these things like rules and regulations, like the first step. The, fir the first step is control of the senses, the second one following rules and regulations. You have to do things like brahmacharya. That is very difficult for most people in the Kali Yuga to practice strictly these kind of principles. Just to get them to sit, just to get people to sit down on the ground and to sit straight and still is very difficult. How long can they do it? Prabhupada would only give class for about half an hour because he knew after half an hour the listening span of the people was very poor. So to get people to perform these kind of activities which are required for Astanga Yoga, practically impossible in the Kali Yuga. Some people do yoga postures it's, it's more like gymnastics than actually yoga. They put it, the emphasis on the physical rather than on the mental and spiritual. So we're trying to explain to people the practicality of bhakti yoga. That bhakti yoga is not difficult. And it's very practical and it's authorized as well. What they think is yoga today is they don't, they don't follow any of the principle, any of the way it's supposed to be done. Okay, going ahead, text number five. We hear about, uh, well, the two daughters of uh, Swambhu Vamanu, there was, there was, uh, Akuti and Prashuti. So Akuti and Prashuti, they were married. Akuti became the wife of Ruchi and Prashuti is the wife of Daksha. So uh, these couples produced, uh, these couples, Prabhupada, these couples and their children produced immense number of children to populate the entire universe. <laughs> so, 
they did a big job in helping Lord Brahma to populate the universe. We know about Daksha. Daksha was very expert. You can read, for example, in the fourth canto, how he had 10,000 sons, the Haryasvas, and then the Shavalasvas, 10,000 sons, and then 1,000 sons. <laughs> but they all met Narada Muni, and Narada Muni didn't let them go back home. So, uh, anyway, Daksha was very expert in producing children. And after, after he produced the sons, then he thought, better I produce daughters rather than sons, because the sons are not coming home. So we'll have daughters, and they won't leave home. They'll be better. And so, anyway, Daksha and Ruchi, they were also helping Lord Brahma in this work of populating the universe, and they accepted the two daughters of Swain Bhuvamanu, Akuti and Prachuti. So, Vidura asks, tell me how the worshipful Ruchi and Daksha generated children after securing as their wives the other two daughters of Swambhu Vamanu. So he wants to hear, Vidura wants to hear about that also. So text number six, Maitreya replies, we hear, uh, commanded by Lord Brahma to beget children in the world, the worshipful Kardama practic practicing penance on the bank of the river Saraswati for 10,000 years. So we see Kardama Muni, that he's a, an obedient son of Brahma. He was given the instruction by Lord Brahma, asked to populate, uh, populate children, to populate the universe. And he took it very seriously, that before engaging in the activity, he first of all went to do meditation for 10,000 years in order to be properly prepared to fulfill this task to Lord Brahma. That's a very nice thing to do, actually. In, in uh, Thailand, in Thailand it's a Buddhist country, and we often see there in Thailand that the Thai people, before the young man is married, he will first of all become a monk. So before his, ma before his marriage takes place, he first of all goes into the monastery and he will shave his head and put on the robes of a monk. And he will live in the monastery for a month or two months or whatever, maybe longer even. And then he will stay there in the monastery for some time. And then after he comes out, after he finishes his period, which he vowed to do, then he will go home and then he will be married. The idea is it will help the, the boy to prepare himself for family life and for being a, a householder. So I think it's a very good thing to do actually. I think it's very nice. I think we should encourage that also. We should have young men before they get married, before they enter into family life, that you come and live in the ashram for a period of time and stay with the devotees and wake up early every morning and do chanting and everything and just eat prasadam. And in this way, you get control over your mind and senses and then you're much more prepared to enter into the responsibility of family life. Everyone agree? Don't you think that would be good? Yes, Maharaj. Yeah, we should encourage this. Uh, people should understand moving into the ashram doesn't mean that you have to stay forever in the ashram. But come for some time and get some purification and then take up your responsibilities in the material world. So Kadama Muni practiced penance. He did his yoga. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada writes in the purport there of text number six. Therefore, 
Yoga practice can be successfully performed by persons who have a very long duration of life, such as 100,000 years. In that way, it is possible to have perfection in yoga. We don't have anywhere near that kind of duration of life. So we have to have a very powerful and very effective process. And that is given by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Hmm. Kali Yuga Dharma Hari Nam Sankirtan. We have to chant the holy name. The, the chanting of the holy name is the only way in the Kali Yuga. No other way, no other way. Not by karma, not by jnana, not by yoga. Only by the holy name. And we really have to make great efforts to chant the holy name because that's the, the most important activity in the Kali Yuga. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu personally taught everyone to chant the holy name. Lord Krishna told everyone to surrender and then he came as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to show everyone how to surrender by chanting the holy name. All right, then text number seven. During that period of penance, the sage Kadama, by worship through devotional service in trance, propitiated the personality of Godhead, who is the quick bestower of all blessings upon those who flee to him for protection. We should do like that. We, that is part of surrender. There are six items of surrender, and one of them is to know that only Krishna can protect us. So we should be, we should be where, wherever there is danger, wherever there is difficulties in material life, we definitely want to take full shelter of the personality of Godhead. He is our protector. Only He can save us. Without the grace of Krishna, then we're simply under the modes of material nature. We're struggling material existence. So I've, I've marked a, a section of the purport here of text number seven. In this age of Kali, the direct method is especially more feasible than the indirect because people are short living, their intelligence is poor and they are poverty stricken and embarrassed by so many miserable disturbances. <laughs> is it true? Are we definitely short living compared to other ages we have a short life and then the indirect pro there's two processes being described the Prabhupada said devotional service is the direct process all others are indirect so astanga yoga jnana yoga everything else is all indirect but bhakti yoga is the direct process so Prabhupada is giving reasons why we have to do bhakti yoga. He said, short life, intelligence is poor. Poor intelligence, yes, we, we, we do have, our intelligence is very poor, very weak. We have not cultivated good brains. One reason is we don't have long enough time. <laughs> We, we're not in this world long enough to get good intelligence. We spend a few years in school or college and then you're put to work. We don't get much time to cultivate good intelligence. In previous ages, just like Kadama Muni, 10,000 years doing, doing Astanga Yoga. So you can get much sharper, much more powerful intelligence when you do that kind of thing. And then poverty-stricken, 
we're all poverty stricken. We're thinking, oh, we're rich. We have a car. We travel to foreign countries. We're not poor. Actually, <laughs> we're very poor. Our, our wealth is not very significant. Whatever wealth we have, simply paper. Our wealth is there in the form of paper and plastic. Even the, the money has become plastic. It used to be coins were gold. People actually used to have gold and jewels and gems. And they kept their wealth in these things. But nowadays, you don't, you, don't get much, you don't find much gold. I don't know where it all went to. People just have paper money, plastic money. You have credit cards and these kind of things. We don't have really much wealth. We're dependent on so much technology. In the past, people had everything natural. The food they could, they, they lived fully depending on nature. We bring everything from foreign countries and it's frozen and packaged in plastic boxes. It's so unhealthy. Nothing is natural anymore. I went, I was in Malaysia and we went to visit one hill station. So there was one Indian man there and he, uh, he was a friend of another devotee. And he took us to see his farm and he was cultivating and growing vegetables, but he was doing it all in a most unnatural manner. There was hardly any soil, and everything was just some chemicals which were sprayed onto the vegetables. And he said, oh, in this way, all of the vegetables are the same size. And he said, this is what the supermarkets want. They want everything should be the same. Each of the cucumbers and each of the tomatoes and each of the melons, they should all be the same size. Then it's very easy for them to price them. <laughs> but he said if we grow them naturally, they're all shapes and sizes. And so they, they have these chemical processes and of course they use hybrid seeds. It's so artificial and so unnatural. And even the workers there, they told me it's very unsatisfying that because you're growing vegetables, but there's, it's so unnatural. There's just no real pleasure, no satisfaction in it. When things are actually in the earth and growing from the ground, you can feel much more relationship with them. But the way they do it now, it's so unnatural. It's just like factory like a factory producing things. So even the vegetables which we eat, it's, it's like something coming out of a factory. Not, it's not natural anymore. And because of that, there's no real nourishment, there's no real benefit in these things. All right, so we're hearing about the advantage of uh, the chanting of the holy name, that it is much easier than this Astanga Yoga. We cannot do like Kadama Muni. Some people, they like to try. They think it looks more spiritual. Yes, it may look spiritual. It doesn't mean they can do it. Okay, so we heard Kardama Muni was able to propitiate the Supreme Lord and the Lord is pleased to appear before him. In text number 9, we hear how the lotus-eyed Lord is pleased with Kardama Muni and he appears in his transcendental form. So Prabhupada mentions, he said, two points are very significant. He said, first is Kardama Muni attained success in yoga practice in the beginning of Satya Yuga. 
when people used to live a hundred thousand years. So the Lord showed him his form, which is not imaginary. We do hear people talk about the Lord not having any form. If God has a form, it would be material. They cannot understand the Lord can have a spiritual form. So that is the important point that the Lord has a form and Kardama Muni was able to actually realize that. The form which the Lord showed to Kardama Muni is described in the Vedic literature. So Kadama Muni was already a liberated soul. The Lord is appearing to him. The Lord doesn't appear to everyone, but Kadama Muni being this, one of the sons of Brahma, and because he's also uh, going to help to populate the universe, so the Lord is pleased with him. And he certainly was pleased that he did 10,000 years penances in Astanga Yoga and the Lord is coming before him. So for a few verses, we hear the description of the Lord's form. Devotees, we should always meditate on the form of the Lord, remember his different features described here. It was described that uh, he's wearing a garland of white lotuses and water lilies. So it's interesting and a little different from what we usually hear. Usually we'll hear the Lord has a garland with many different colors of flowers, but here it says white lotuses and water lilies. And the Lord was clad, that's usual, yellow silk, and his lotus hair fringed with dark locks of curly hair. Well, that's common. And of course his eternal form, effulgent like the sun, that's also expected. And then text number 10 says, adorned with a crown and earrings, nothing exceptional there. And his, for, his forearm form, so three of the hands have the usual features, the conch, the disc, and the mace. And then the other hand is a white lily in the fourth. Now, usually he would hold a lotus, but here it's a little different. He's holding a lily in his hand. And he's happy. He's a smiling mood, which is captivating the heart of all the devotees. And then he's also, just, he has a kastupa gem around his neck. And then uh, a golden streak on his chest, which is Lakshmi, and he stood in the air with his lotus feet placed on the shoulders of Garuda. So he's able to stand on the shoulders of Garuda. So Prabhupada talks about the nature of the Lord's form, how it's all according to the Vedic descriptions. Everything is described there. People accuse us of being idol worshippers. Sometimes uh, people from the West, they will say that in this Vedic culture, people simply worship idols. But this is not idol worship. We are worshipping the Lord according to the descriptions which are given in the scriptures. Everything is described. At the end of the purport, Prabhupada said, these descriptions are authoritative and a Krishna conscious person takes them directly, acts on them, preaches them and practices devotional service as enjoined in the authoritative scripture. So we're, we are 
often we have often have to defend ourselves, we have to defend our practice, that we're not idol worshippers. There are people who worship idols, but we're not in that category. We worship deities, which is the actual form of the Lord. And it's a form which is described in the scriptures. Not only described in the scriptures, it's also narrated in the, by the different great sages who actually see. Just like here in this chapter, the Lord appeared to Kardama Muni. So it was dis it's being described. Kardama Muni, he saw the Lord and was described. So, Kardama Muni, seeing the form of the Lord, he's greatly satisfied and he offers his obeisances. He does dandabats, he falls on the ground and he, uh, he, he, he's, very, he's very satisfied to see the Lord. His heart is full of love of God. And now he's going to begin to offer his prayers to the Lord. So in the purport, Prabhupada talks a lot about Patanjali, the yoga system described by Patanjali. Right? The yoga sutras came from Patanjali. And Patanjali also talks about Astanga Yoga. And generally people, they, they like the, the descriptions which are there in the yoga sutras given by Patanjali. They think this is all, this is real yoga. It's a lot of leaning towards impersonalism. But Prabhupada explains actually beneath that impersonalism, you can see also there's personal features. So the Patanjali yoga system is uh, Authorized as one of the six philosophical systems mentioned in the scriptures. There are six different darshans. So Patanjali, Yoga Sutra is one. And then of course others are like uh, Jaimini, Karma Mimamsa, and Gotama, Logic, Nyaya. And then also you have uh, Vedanta from Vyasadeva, and you have Sankhya from Kapila, and then there's one also from Astavakra, Astavakra which is the atomic theory that everything is from atoms. Like this there are six different philosophical darshans. And of course the best one of all is from Vyasadeva who has given us the Vedanta Darshan. But uh, Patanjali's Yoga is also one of the authorized system, but it's impersonal. All, the, all of these philosophical systems are impersonal, except for Srila Vyasadeva, who's speaking Vedanta. But the others are generally all impersonal. All right, so Kadama Muni is going to begin to offer his prayers to the Supreme Lord. And he's, in his prayers, he's going to talk about... Oh, Krishna. In his prayers, he's going to talk about how people who worship the Supreme Lord for material desires are foolish. Advanced yogis aspire to see your transcendental form. Some, some advanced yogis want to see the
cannot give class with that noise going on all the time. All right, so Kadama's praying. And usually when people pray, they have a request. They want something. Right? But before you, before you ask for your request, you should first of all speak some nice words, praising, glorifying. Right? Just like your daughter comes to you and she'll say, Oh, Daddy, you're so nice. You're such a nice father. You're so good to me. I love you so much. And then she says, Daddy, can you give me money? I want to buy this new dress, right? Or I want the new mobile phone. Can you get me the new mobile phone? Something, you know? This is the art of prayer. When we offer prayers to the Lord, we should also speak some glorification first. You don't immediately tell the Lord what you want. And so we see here Kadama also. He's glorifying the Lord, talking some nice things and describing also about the foolishness of materialistic people. Like he says here in text number 14, he says, uh, your lotus feet are the true vessel to take one across the ocean of mundane nations. Only persons deprived of their intelligence by the spell of the deluding energy will worship those feet with a view to attain the trivial and momentary pleasures of the senses, which even persons rotting in hell can attain. However, O oh my Lord, you are so kind that you bestow mercy even upon them. So, Kotama Muni is glorifying the, the mercy of the Lord, that the Lord fulfills the desires of everyone. We, we get our desires according to our qualification. We say man proposes, God disposes. And so, you know, not that we get everything exactly the way we want it, but according to our qualification to receive, you get. Somebody may want to be queen, so they may become the queen bee in a hive, you know. It may not be queen of a country, maybe a queen bee, and they have all the other bees collecting honey. And this way they get the position of queen. Or you may be king, but you may be king in the jungle. You may be in the lion body, king of the jungle. So, After describing like that, number text number 14, then Kadama Muni explains his own personal desire. And, he, and he, he comes to the point, he says, Therefore, desiring to marry a girl of like disposition, who may prove to be a veritable cow of plenty in my married life, to satisfy my lustful desire, I too have sought the shelter of your lotus feet, which are the source of everything, for you are like a desire tree. So Kadama Muni says, you know, he wants to enjoy married life. He wants to have a suitable woman who will be able to satisfy his natural desires. And at the same time, he'll be able to fulfill the instructions given to him by his father, Brahma. So in the purport, uh, we've noted now, Kadama Muni expressed his material inability 
and desire before the Lord by saying, Although I know that nothing material should be asked from you, I nevertheless desire to marry a girl of like disposition. Now, nothing, when we worship the Lord for something material, we know it, it is it actually wrong or is it all right? Is it authorized by the Vedas to worship the Lord for something material? What do you say? Thank you, Mr. Maharaj. Yes. Uh, well, the, the first class is not to desire material, but if we have desire, it is better to approach the Supreme Lord. Yes, right. It's good if you don't have any materialism, but actually we all have desires, right? Everybody is going to have some desires. We've come into this world because we have desires. Brought us into this world, we took our birth. If we didn't have desires, we wouldn't be here in this world. So, what, what does Shastra say? Does Shastra approve of us worshipping the Lord for material desires? Yes, Maharaj. Bhagavatam also says, Akamo Sarva Kamo Moksha Kamo Dharati. Right. Yes. Yes. And if we have material desires, and if the Lord fulfills our material desires, then what will happen? Then uh, uh, we, our desires are fulfilled, plus we also get purified. If our desires are fulfilled, we get purified? Really? No, uh, no, not if desires, both will happen, like Lord will fulfill desire at the same time because we have approached the Supreme Lord, we also get to it. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, yes. um, if our uh, desires are fulfilled, then uh, people can take up to devotional service. They will be uh, saturated with, the, uh, with whatever desires they had and then they can slowly take up to the uh, devotional service. Well, certainly they will have more faith, right? Their faith will be strengthened that the Lord fulfilled their prayers, they got their desire. So the Lord granted their prayer, so they're happy. They have faith in the Lord now, and they can worship Him more fully. Of course, we, we have one material desire, the Lord fulfilled it. We think, oh, I, I should have another desire. They give me one thing, I can ask something else. There'll be no end to it. That's the one problem with coming with material desires, that material desires don't end with this one thing. We want more and more. <laughs> There's no end to it. That, that is a problem. So giving up the material desires and coming to the higher level, certainly it's good that we go to the Lord rather than to worship demigods. We could worship demigods, but it's better to worship the Supreme Lord. Why? Why is it better to worship the Lord and not demigods? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, actually, we should ask from our father, not from our neighborhoods or uncles for our... Uh, that is one point. Another point is uh, the Lord being very merciful will not only satisfy the desire, uh, also see how much we can take it. Like uh, if we ask our mother or father for 100 chocolates, being uh, means very innocent child without knowing any uh, good or bad, but the parents will only give or satisfy our desire, uh, which will not harm us. So that's the benefit from asking. And as Gopkumar Prabhuji was telling, uh, by uh, giving, Lord also will satisfy our desires and also purify us so that we will not have this desire and hankering for uh, uh, many more years to come. So we will also get purified. Yes, we hope so. Yes, we should. Yes, any other points about why we worship the Lord and not the dev demigods? Hare Krishna Maharaj, yes. what are the demigods? It's very temporary in nature. We cannot, it's not, a, it's not help for us to grow in the spiritual progress. Yes, but why worship, why worship the demigods? If we go, go to Krishna for material things, it's the same thing, right? So why worship Krishna for material things? Why don't we worship the demigods? 
Yes, Guru Maharaj, it yes. is yes. Maharaj. It's the Lord who is reservoir. He is the one who actually awards. Yes, right. Even if the demigods have to give, it is only through the uh, Supreme Lord. Yeah, so. he, he has to sanction the desire, right? The demigods cannot simply independently bestow something. They have to take sanction from the Supreme Lord before they can give it. Mm. Of course, demigods are easily satisfied, but the Supreme Lord is more difficult to satisfy. And so people may think like that. They think, well, it's so much easier, I, so much quicker, I get results much quicker when I worship the demigods. Why I should worship the Supreme Lord? Mm -hmm. It's so much quicker. The demigods are easy to please. Mm -hmm. So what's the problem there? Is they want to enjoy separately from Krishna. This shows their intense desire or the mental attachments they have. Material bondage also creates Prabhupada Maharaj. If we ask from the demigods, we are again and again bound up in this material world. So that is also one of the uh, results are temporary and not fully satisfied. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking more, I'm thinking that the, the Supreme Lord also, He's very careful before He gives some benediction. He will consider, is this actually good for the person? You know, demigods generally, they will give their blessings very easily. They don't consider what is actually good for the person. So they don't really have the welfare of the person at heart. But the Supreme Lord, he's more cautious, he's more careful. He thinks, is this actually good for this person? Is this really going to help them? Or maybe it's just going to put them deeper into bondage and more into ignorance. So the Lord is much more cautious before he will bestow benedictions on people. That's one point I was thinking about. All right, so uh, mentioned here about Kardama, the, the Kardama's desire to get married, he said, he said, Prabhupada writes, formerly boys and girls of similar dispositions were married. The similar nature of the boy and girl were united in order to make them happy. So that's a, a very important point that the man and woman to make successful married life, uh, to have a proper family life, there should be some similarities, they should have some similar disposition. And that's one of the reasons why people would be conscious about the, what kind of caste or what kind of varna or ashram they're in, what varna, you know, a brahmana girl, she should marry a man from a brahmana family, usually. And a kshatriya man, he can marry a woman from a kshatriya family. That's better. That makes it easy because the natures are similar, natures are compatible. Of course, in, in the Western society, we don't have that kind of culture. But it certainly makes a big difference and it helps to make the marriages much more successful. So understanding the nature of each other is important. Now Kardama Muni wanted to have a wife of like disposition because a wife is necessary to assist in spiritual and material advancement. Right? Wife is considered the better half of the man because the wife takes care of so many things, particularly in the home. And of course, some places now, mostly in many places now, women are also working, but generally the wife is at home. 
then she's the better half of the man because she will take care of the, all the things at home. She'll look after the children, and she'll keep the home clean, and she'll prepare the meals and all these things. So then Prabhupada talks about astrology, and by astrology you can understand people's nature and what is their astrological situation. Some people have good charts, some people have bad charts. So Prabhupada said, in astrology, a man is considered fortunate if he has great wealth, good sons, or a good wife. And he said, most important is to have a good wife. He's considered the most fortunate. So before marrying, they should select a woman of like disposition. So Prabhupada tells about his own life. Of course, Prabhupada, that's a long time ago. But anyway, Prabhupada told us, said when his father arranged his marriage for him, he said he did not like that girl very much. But his father told him, then that's good. <laughs> it's good you don't like her very much. You won't be too attached to her. Sometimes it's said, a beautiful wife is the enemy of a man. If the wife is very attractive, and if the man is very enamored by the beauty of the wife, that is a problem. It's not very good for family life. Of course, these points are difficult for people to practice. It's easy to talk about them. And put it into practice is difficult. So in the purport, reading from purport here, text 15, Prabhupada says, Kardama Muni could have asked his benediction from Uma, for it is recommended in the scriptures that if anyone wants a good wife, he should worship Uma. But he preferred to worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead because it is recommended in the Bhagavatam that everyone, whether he is full of desires, has no desire or desires liberation, should worship the Supreme Lord. Of these three classes of men, one tries to be happy by fulfillment of material desires, another wants to be happy by becoming one with the Supreme, and another, the perfect man, is a devotee. He does not want anything in return from the Personality of Godhead. He only wants to render loving service. In any case, everyone should worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead for he will fulfill everyone's desires. The advantage of worshipping the Supreme Person is that even if one has desires for material enjoyment, if he worships Krishna, he will gradually become a pure devotee and have no more material hankering. So as you were saying, he will become purified. If he worships Krishna, he will become purified. So that is the main thing. That's what we, we should actually want. Of course, material world, not everyone wants to be purified. One of our devotee ladies told me she took some prasadam home and she offered it to her husband. She said, please have some prasadam. He said to her, no, I don't want any prasadam. I don't want to get purified. <laughs> so you do get people like that, stubborn people, they don't want to be purified, they just want to rot in material existence. So uh, the important point, common disposition, as I mentioned earlier, Kardama was Mahayogi and Devahuti is also Yoga Lakshana. So they're both great yogis, so it's, it's, it's good. 
their combination is good. So Kadama goes on offering his prayers and he talks about uh, He talks about, because he'd done yoga for 10,000 years. So, you know, you'd think after doing yoga for 10,000 years, why does he not ask for liberation? But Prabhupada said that, he said, uh, why did he want to enjoy material life? Why did he want to get married in spite of his personally seeing and experiencing the Supreme Lord, the answer is not everyone is competent to be liberated from material bondage. <laughs> so we do get cases like that. Within ISKCON, we see also similar situations. Sometimes people renounce the world. Sometimes people even accept the renounced order of life, sannyas. But then after some time, they become restless and they become disturbed and they even give up their renounced position and they want to enter into family life. So this is a problem. Sometimes people renounce prematurely. They try to renounce the world prematurely at an early age like at the age, in their twenties or thirties, they renounce. And then when they get to middle age, then they have a change of heart. <laughs> and they think, they're thinking that, you know, I think I should get married, I think I should have a... There was even, there was also a case, there was one man, he, he went to Swami Narayan. So he was in the Swami Narayan ashram. But he was an elderly man, and at a certain point he decided he didn't want to be in the ashram anymore. He wanted to come home. <laughs> but the family told him, no, no, we don't want you, don't come home. <laughs> the, family told, the family wouldn't let him come home. They said, no, you just stay where you are. <laughs> he said, no, I don't want to be here. And they said, no, come, you should stay there. <laughs> So, d difficult, the mind, the unsteady mind, the flickering mind, sometimes we renounce everything and then next minute we want to come back and enjoy the world. And sometimes people think, well, I failed the last time, I think if I try, I try again, I think I can be successful. So, we have the Vedic culture is there, the Vedic culture is there. There are four ashrams, right? Brahmachari is the first part of life and then Grihastha life. And Grihastha life is not eternal. Grihastha life also moves into Vanaprastha or retired ashram. So everyone should be, understand that, they should want to follow through these different ashrams. You go on from Grihastha life, you go on to Vanaprastha, and then you can even renounce fully after that. So that is the Vedic culture. Are you all planning like that? Are you planning to come back and live in India at some point? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Very good. Yes, Maharaj. And you're all going to be Vanaprastas, right? Yes, Maharaj. You're ready to re retire, take up yeah. full-time service to Krishna, right? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Yes. You don't just, don't worry about the children and so on, you know, you don't have to worry about the children. You have to worry about yourself. The problem is to get very attached to the family and you think, oh, my daughter, oh, and her, she's got a, the grandchild, the, the grandchildren are there, oh, I need to see the grandchildren. No, that's not the process. You have to renounce, right? You come to the holy place 
and you travel and go to visit the holy place, that's vana prastha. Don't get stuck in the family life. That's a griha andakupam. Don't get in that well. Okay? So good. I'm pleased to hear you're all going to re retire soon and come to Mayapur. Okay. Mr. Maharaj? Yes. Uh, Maharaj, yes, uh, sorry for uh, disturbing. Maharaj, there is a one uh, obvious question is there for us. So in that they ask, how can you evaluate divorce within this con? Um, how, okay. how, how can we what? Uh, it, there is a obvious question. It's asked, how can you evaluate divorce within ISKCON in reference to love marriage and arranged marriage? So can I have some input from your side, Maharaj? How can we evaluate divorce in ISKCON? Yes. Well, actually we're not supposed to, we don't, we don't approve of divorce. Divorce is not really a sanctioned in ISKCON, but it happens. Why does it happen? Well, one reason is that the people, they don't prepare themselves properly for entering into the Grihastha Ashram. 